right, so the last section we're going to talk about in Unit 6 on learning behaviorism is not our traditional classical conditioning or operant conditioning. It's going to be a third type called vicarious learning. Vicarious learning is also sometimes called social learning theory, and that's because we can change our behavior through watching others. And that is watching others will shape our own behavior. We see other people get reinforced. We see other people get punished. We're going to learn to do or not do certain behaviors. Even if we see people engage in other things and they get classically conditioned, we might also be classically conditioned. But vicarious learning is not just watching operant conditioning or watching classical conditioning take place. Vicarious learning is something else. It's the idea that sometimes people don't need to receive any consequences and we just want to do what they're doing. We want to mimic and model after them. And so we see this modeling behavior very early on in our lifetime. We see babies learn to smile. They don't know if we're getting reinforced by smiling, but it's a reflex. So they'll just want to do what we do. Young children will sit and talk and have the same mannerisms as their parents, and not seeking out any particular reinforcement. They just desire to be like them. And we find there's four criteria for vicarious learning. The first is you have to be able to pay attention to the other person. You have to attend to what's going on. It can't be something that you're inattentive of or something that's subliminal. The second is you have to be able to retain it. It has to be something you can remember. Even if it's not in your explicit memory, which we'll talk about in Unit 7, even if it's only in your implicit memory, you have to be able to retain it. The third is you have to be able to actually do it. It doesn't help if you are seeing something that you cannot replicate. Let's say you're a baby that doesn't know how to walk and you see someone hop. You're not going to attempt to hop. It's not something you can do at that point in your development. A dog who does not have opposable thumbs will not want to text message, for instance. They won't be able to reproduce it. And the final one is motivation. And this can be a little bit tricky. Motivation does not mean that you seek out a reinforcement or that you seek to avoid a punishment. Motivation could just be that you want to fit in or that you want to feel satisfied or there could be other types of motivators aside from our traditional reinforcements and punishments. And we see this all the time. It tends to happen with parental figures. It also happens with what we call role models in the media. So if we see someone on TV and they're wearing a certain product, let's say a lipstick, and we like them, we attend to it, we can remember it, and we're motivated to feel like we're similar to them, then we're going to try and wear the same product as them. And how we really discovered this theory is by Canadian-born Albert Bandura. And so Albert Bandura, he's most famous for what's known as the Bobo doll experiment. In the Bobo doll experiment, this was a controlled laboratory setting where there was a playroom. And in the playroom, there was a child who was on looking and there was an adult. And the adult approached an uh, inflatable, punchable clown. And it was a clown that was, it was one of those air-filled sandbags that you could punch and it would weeble and it would wobble, but it won't fall down sort of idea. And the adult would interact with the clown in a certain manipulated way. And the adult was in on the experiment. The adult was a research assistant. The child didn't know what was happening but the child would attend to what the adult was doing and the child would remember it. And the child would reproduce exactly what the adult did. So in some situations, the adult would interact with the clown in an aggressive way, and then the adult would leave the room. And then the child would have the opportunity to play in the playroom and use the same toys the adult had. And what we found is whatever the adult did, the child did. If the adult was really aggressive to the clown and punched the clown, when they left, the child would go up to the clown and punch them. If the adult hit the inflatable clown with a hammer, the child would pick up the hammer and hit the clown. If the adult pointed a gun and said bang at the clown, the child would do the same. Now keep in mind the hammer and the gun were always in the room, but the child would only pick them up if the adult had picked them up. We also find if the adult was non-aggressive, if they offered the clown tea, the child would offer the clown tea. So this was a really important study, and it really highlighted how kids will model exactly what they see in older adults and older figures, and that they are constantly watching and attending and retaining what is going on. And as soon as they can reproduce it, they will. So this is really important in terms of understanding the cycle of domestic violence. And, and this is how it might not necessarily be peer pressure that causes kids to act in a certain way, but it's this mimicking and modeling effect where we're hardwired to respond and reproduce the behaviors we see in others and makes us feel like we are more similar to them. 
There is a neurological explanation for this, and this has to do with our mirror neurons. So our mirror neurons are the idea that when we look at something, we can take the perspective of another person. We can feel empathy, and we can feel extra activity in our vagus nerve. That's the longest nerve in our body that goes from the back of our neck down around our aorta and up our chest. And this is the idea that if you're watching a horror movie and something's really scary, although you're safe and you're on your couch, you might feel your skin crawl. You might feel very afraid and very startled. If you're watching a romance film and something really mushy or loving happens, or you know those tears of joy, that, that heartwarming moment happens, you might feel that heartwarming sensation in your chest where you feel your heart expand and you feel those tears of happiness. And if you see, let's say, a skateboarding video and somebody does a stunt that goes wrong and they land on their neck or some sort of injury, you might actually feel that flinch of pain and you go, oh, and that's your mirror neurons. This is allowing you to perspective take and allowing you to understand what they're going through. So this is a main mechanism in vicarious learning where we understand what other people are doing and we seek to feel like that. So that section was a bit briefer, but it is an important component of how we learn and how we change our behavior. You've now made it to the end of Unit 6, Learning and Behavior. Congratulations.